Welcome to Marlow Baptist Church. Thank you for joining us today. What a blessing it is for us to hear God's word in these times. We are living in difficult times and many people are struggling. But we are so grateful that as God's people we have an anchor and that anchor is our Lord Jesus Christ. So may we be encouraged today as we hear God's word. But may we be encouraged not just to be hearers of God's word but also doers. Because God has called us for a purpose as his people. Let us live our lives for his honor and glory. And let us reach out with the wonderful message of Jesus Christ that changes lives. I take a reading today from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, reading from verse 13 to 18. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. In these times we are living in, we need comfort and we need hope. As Christians, as God's people, we have a hope not just in this world, but also in the next Death is very difficult. And because we live in this physical world, we are governed by time and space, we have a beginning and an end, death is really difficult, even for the child of God. But Paul writes this passage to encourage us to know that those who have died in Jesus are with Jesus now, and we will be united with them. But for us who are here, we have a hope that we look toward the heavens and we await the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul also writes and says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So as difficult as things might be, we know that the worst thing we can face in this world is death and that to the Christian is even a friend to unite us with Jesus. But it is still challenging. It is very difficult. So we encourage others, we try and and be there for others and share the hope that we have beyond this world. Because Jesus Christ lived, he died, and he rose again to prove to us that there's life beyond the grave. So we can take comfort from that. And that is why Paul writes here and says, Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Let us take comfort from the word of God that we have a hope beyond this world even in these difficult times. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we approach your throne of grace today. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness, for your mercy, for your righteousness, for your holiness. And we thank you, Lord, that we can approach you. And we approach you, Lord, in humility, in praise and thanks, Lord, for who you are as the creator of heaven and earth, as the sovereign of the universe. Lord, we are so grateful that you are mindful of us because we acknowledge our sin. We know we fall short. And Lord, we repent of the things that we do. We also repent of the things we fail to do. And we pray that you'll be with us and help us, Lord. Our flesh is weak, but our spirit is willing because you have made us alive. So we repent of that which we have done, but we are so grateful for the forgiveness that we have found in you and your finished work. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for your sacrifice, Lord. And we live because you have given to us life. And help us to live for your honor and glory. Lord, we pray at this time for families who are struggling, those who've lost loved ones, those who are living in fear, those who've lost income 
and a livelihood. We pray for young people who are struggling with mental health. We pray for families who are under stress and strain. And Lord, it's really a difficult situation, so we pray that you'll be merciful, that in these times the gospel will spread and lives will be changed. We pray for our church, Lord, here in Marlow. We pray that you will use us in these times to reach out to our town. We pray for our town. We pray for those who don't know you and help us to reach out to them with the gospel. We also pray for the surrounding areas and help us to be a witness in these times. We also pray for our church and for our congregation. We pray for each other, that we will encourage each other, be there for each other, because it is difficult for all of us. But help us to be there for one another. We pray that you will help us to to turn to you in prayer as a congregation, to build upon your your word, to build our lives on your word, that everything we do and say will be focused on what you've called us to do in your word. So help us to be faithful to you and faithful to your word at this time. Lord, we just pray for those in our church who might be struggling physically, emotionally, personally, and also spiritually, Lord. It's really a difficult time. But Lord, we know that in you we have all the resources we need. Thank you, Lord, that we can find our sufficiency in you because you are sufficient. So we just pray that you'll encourage us. We also just bring before you Jan, and we pray that you'll be with her. We pray, Lord, for her at this time, that she will recover. We know it's very difficult. We pray for Libby and the whole family. We know that Jan knows you, and we take comfort from that, Lord. But we pray that you'll be merciful to her, and that you'll be with her. May she sense your peace and presence. We also pray for Keith and Marion, and the family, we just pray for Keith's recovery. Please be with him. We thank you, Lord, for the recovery we have seen, but we just pray for continued recovery. But thank you, Lord, that we also know that he knows you, and what a blessing that is to us. We also pray for Neville and Juanita. We thank you, Lord, that they're on the road to recovery. We pray that you will be with them. We just pray for our congregation, Lord. We just pray that we encourage each other. We pray also for the leaders in our world and the government. We pray that you will be with the government in our country and also the rest of the world. And we pray for wisdom. We know there are some difficult decisions that need to be made, but we pray that they will be wise and do what is right and do what is best and that they will be able to make righteous decisions. You've commanded us to pray for the government, Lord, so we pray. We pray also for the freedom to worship. We pray that certain freedoms will be returned to us to be able to sing and be together and be able to worship you in absolute freedom. But at this time, Lord, we respect what has been said to us and what we need to do. But, Lord, we long to be able to worship you and to go back to a normal time. So we just pray, Lord, that you will intervene. Lord, we also come before you and we pray for the church worldwide. We pray that in these times the church will be salt and light in their community. We pray that churches will be focused on your word, preach your word faithfully, because we know that faith comes by hearing and hearing from your word. So we know, Lord, that as we preach your word, Holy Spirit, you will do that work in the lives of people. So we come before you, Lord, today, and we pray that you'll help us to be faithful. We also pray, Lord, for today, we pray for everything said and done. We pray that we will honor you, and that everything said and done, Lord, will only bring you honor and bring you glory as we commit ourselves, Lord, to you today. In your wonderful name we pray, the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We are also now going to say the Lord's Prayer together, so you can bow your heads with me and we just say the Lord's Prayer. 
Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. continue our series on the Gospel of Matthew. Today we are considering Matthew chapter 7 and I've entitled the message, Lord, Lord. Our reading is taken from Matthew chapter 7 and we read from verse 15 to 29. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. 
A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. And it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. Now everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a, like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell. And great was its fall. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. This final chapter of the Sermon on the Mount is a sobering chapter. It is a chapter of warning, of rebuke, and it strikes at the heart of false religion and pseudo-faith. The nation of Israel was built on the foundation of the Old Testament and Judaism. In the time of Christ, Israel's religion was just that, a religion that moved very far away from the Old Testament and what God had given to them. It was not built upon the Word of God. It was built on the Word of man and also the works of man. Israel was a theocracy. It was governed by religious leaders. And this government was called the Sanhedrin. In this government, it consisted of two religious groups, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees were more orthodox. They believed in the Old Testament and also their application of what the Old Testament taught. It is for this reason that Jesus speaks so often and says to the Pharisees, your law says this. Because what the Pharisees did was they applied certain things to the scriptures and then governed the people like that and put pressure on the people based upon what they inserted or applied from the scriptures. The second group was the Sadducees. They rejected most of the Old Testament. They only believed in the first five books of the Old Testament. They did not believe in the supernatural. They did not believe in angels or in heaven. They were the liberals of their day. Now within the religious government of Israel, the Sadducees were the most dominant group. And it's important for us to Understand that because at the time of Christ, it wasn't this orthodox Judaism that governed the, the whole country or the people. It was far more leaning toward liberals at the, at the highest level of religious authority and religious teachings. It wasn't the rabbis or the, or the priests. It was the liberals that controlled much of what was happening in the nation of Israel. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus Christ is speaking to the crowd. He's speaking to people. And he's instructing them about true faith. We've seen that in chapter 5, 6, and also here in chapter 7. But Jesus also highlights the hypocrisy of the religious leaders in Israel. The religious leaders focused on words and outward appearance of righteousness, but they did not know God. The people trusted these religious leaders. They looked to them for answers and for guidance. So Jesus Christ was pointing them to God, not to the religious leaders. And that is why Jesus Christ would look at the crowd and feel sorry for them. Because they were sheep without true shepherds. 
How did Israel, God's people, become dominated by false religion and liberalism? How did the covenant people find themselves in this place? They moved away from the Word of God as the authority. Throughout the Old Testament, the very specific times when Israel returned to the Word of God, when Ezra read the Word of God to the, to the children of Israel when they returned from exile, that was a very important moment. When Josiah the king found the Word of God in the temple, it was a very important moment. There have been times in Israel's history as a people that returned to the Word of God, but unfortunately most of their history is, is, points us to them leaving or moving away from the Word of God as the authority. So what has Christianity become? The church itself is filled with religious leaders who reject the Word of God. It seems that the Christian church mirrors what happened in Israel. There are many religious leaders in the church who preach a message of morality and of pseudo-spirituality. People today are focused on being good, on being nice people, but they've forsaken God. The Christian church is not what God has called it to be. The Christian church has moved away, as Israel did, from the Word of God. We see people following religious leaders and their sayings. They listen to sermons and read books of things that God has never truly said. They talk about God, but they have never truly been saved. In this attempt by the Christian church to try and find favor with the world, the question we have to ask is, where is conversion? Where is the fruits of conversion? Where is the preaching of the word to bring men, women, boys and girls to their knees before God, to repent of their sin and to live a changed life? All we hear today is that Jesus will make your life better. He will bless you. He will just fill that little void that you have, and then your life will be complete because Jesus is the missing piece. All we see is sentimental Christianity, emotion, emotionally driven Christianity, a feel good faith, and the sort of humanitarian Christian religion that's only concerned about either saving the planet or making. Uh, society better or impacting the community with some social outreach but where is the preaching of the word Jesus Christ came to the nation of Israel when they were in the state they'd move away from the word of God and God is speaking to us today as Christians because Christianity is a faith that is real, that is life-changing. It is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the result of that faith is always a transformed life, a change in mind, a change in heart, in life, and in soul. And this is the core of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus Christ is calling people to that transformed life, to live different lives. There are so many in the church today that will say, Lord, Lord, have we not done all of these things? Have we not tried to be nice and good? Have we not tried and be friendly to our neighbors and done good things? Have we not gone to church? Have we not been involved in church? Have we not helped with some, something in the church? And Christ will say, depart from me. I never knew you. And Jesus will say that because there's been no true change in life, in heart, and in spirit, and in soul. And that is why this chapter is so important. It is a warning to us. It was a warning at the time of Christ when he preached that sermon, but it's also a warning to us today. That Christianity is more than the external. Christianity is so much more than just coming to church or being good people. 
It is about a transformed life. So as we look at the passage, firstly, we see from verse 15 to 20, fruits of false teaching. Now, being in spiritual leadership is a great responsibility. The book of James chapter 3 speaks about that. That those who want to be in leadership spiritually will carry greater condemnation. Preaching the word of God is a solemn calling. It is very serious. It is the most powerful message known to man. And to preach it is a privilege. But it is very serious and a solemn calling. Jesus calls the teachers in Israel, and that wasn't just the Pharisees and the Sadducees, because the Pharisees and Sadducees taught the rabbis, instructed rabbis, so it is the whole of Israel's teachers. And Jesus calls them false prophets and wolves in sheep's clothing. Paul the Apostle speaks about the same thing in Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, verse 28 to 31, Paul writes and says, or Luke writes, and Paul actually says this in Acts, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn you. People trust church leaders, they do. But sometimes when people listen to what they read and what they follow, it's actually astounding that people that our Christians are so deceived. Outlandish statements, false teaching and false doctrine, strange accounts, and people follow this. Boasting and egotistical statements of how wonderful and great these spiritual leaders are and everything that they have done. So it really surprises me at times, and it's really sad to see what people actually follow. And then suddenly when everyone questions what is being said, then suddenly they are negative or divisive or they're just um, wanting to be, be nasty or ugly. And then people can't question anything. But what does the Bible say in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1? It says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And Jesus speaks to us here from verse 15 to 20 of these false prophets and false teachers, and he says that you will know them by their fruits. So Christians must be discerning to know what is truth and what is error, and it actually is not that difficult. Because false teachers can be very deceptive, yes, but when the Word of God is our foundation, when it is where we turn, God will lead us into truth. And then we'll be able to discern what is right and what is wrong. But Jesus says, by their fruit you will know them. And there's a twofold application to this. Firstly, the false teachers, their lives will manifest bad fruit. There will be sinful indulgence, ego, uh, sort of self-indulgence. There will also be an unrepented heart when um, they do something or say something that's not right. And, and that's difficult for, for many in spiritual leadership to actually acknowledge when they make a mistake. But false teachers will always focus on themselves and try and project themselves and promote themselves and the fruits of that you will see so their lives will also show you a pattern of unrepentant sin and evil but i think that jesus christ is not just speaking about the false teachers themselves but about something far more sinister and deeper jesus christ is speaking about the fruit 
that will come from their teaching. So when Jesus says, by their fruit, you will know them, because who they produce after themselves, you will see. Because false teaching has consequences. So their false teaching will produce bad fruit in the lives of those who follow them and listen to their teaching. The person that lives by their teaching will show this fruit. Their belief will be manifested in their bad fruit. And that is why false teaching is so dangerous. Not because of the person just teaching it. But because of the seeds that they plant. The influence that they have. The dominance they sometimes have over those who listen to them. And what that will produce. Jesus Christ said to the disciples... Be very careful of the doctrine of the Pharisees, that leaven, because it will have a permeating influence. And it's for this reason that we have to be very wary of false teaching. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 15, Jesus Christ speaks out against the Pharisees, and he says that you go and you cover land and sea to make one proselyte, and when you do, you make him more a child of the devil than yourself. It's once again the fruit from their teaching. So they go and find someone to make them worse than themselves. And Paul writes to us also in 2 Timothy chapter 4, from verse 2 to 4, and says, Preach the word, be ready in season, out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears from the truth and be turned aside to fables. And that is why sound teaching is so important, but many people prefer false teaching because it actually is what's comforting to them. They enjoy that. It it actually helps them because they have these itching ears. But the Bible says that sound teaching produces good fruit. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16, Paul writes to Timothy and says, Take heed to the doctrine that you teach. Why? Because by it you will save yourself and those who hear you. So we have to ask ourselves, who are we listening to? What teaching are we listening to? What are we receiving? And what fruit is that producing in our lives? And what fruit is that producing in the lives of those that hear? Because Jesus Christ gives that warning. Now, it's not just the fruits that these false teachers will produce, but Jesus Christ moves on from false teachers to the people that they were preaching to. And the second part to the to uh, our reading is confession or profession and that's from verse 21 to 23 and it and really is a very scary few verses i actually saw the other day someone said that that is the most frightening verse in the bible lord lord have we not done all of these things and christ says depart from me i never knew you so confession or profession Because true faith is more than words and more than actions. That's what true faith is. It's not about what we say or what we do. And unfortunately, as human beings, we can only go on what someone says and what they do. But true faith is a transformed life, a life that continually is transformed by the power of God. Many are surprised today when people stop going to church or turn their back on their Christian faith. Many are surprised by that. But there is a difference between someone confessing Christ and professing Christ. Confession is a total surrender and acknowledgement of Christ as Savior and Lord. Romans 10.9 says, If we confess the Lord Jesus with our mouth, and believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. So it's a total surrender and acknowledgement of Christ as Savior and Lord. That is confession. But then we have profession, and profession is an outward appearance. 
but not an internal confession or transformation. People that haven't truly repented of their sin and not truly surrendered their lives to Christ. That's a profession. So it looks good on the outside. They do all the right things on the outside, but nothing has truly changed on the inside. And Jesus Christ is speaking about those when He says, they say to me, Lord, Lord, because they know what to say. They deceived into thinking that they truly believe because they come to church or because they do Christian things. But there has never been that change in the heart and life. Salvation is not about external things. That's what Jesus Christ was saying, not just on the Sermon on the Mount, but throughout His ministry. It's not about the external things. It's not about works. It's not about doing good things. It's not about doing things for God. And often that happens in church, and especially those that work at church, or if, if, there's a, if it's a bigger church and there's a staff, often because people are so busy in church and people are involved in church, many people are so involved with the things of God that they're never truly involved with God. We get wrapped up as churches to try and do so much. How much can we do? How great is our church portfolio? It's all about the external, but what about the preaching of the Word? What about the Word that is manifested in our lives? Because people think going to church and reading our Bibles and praying, those things save us. No, they don't. We are saved by Christ and our surrender to Him. The Christian faith is about a spiritual renewal that's taken place, a new life. But with that new life comes commitment to Christ and obedience to His Word. It's a complete obedience to God's Word and an acknowledgement of the finished work of Christ. Now just earlier on in this chapter, in, in verse 13 and 14, Jesus Christ says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way that, which leads to life. And there are few who find it. And why, are, why is there few who find it? It is because there's not an understanding of what it truly means to be a Christian. We always, as human beings, just want to deal with the outside. But Christianity is dealing with the inside. And there are many in the church now, as there was many at the time of Christ, who don't truly understand what it means to know God and serve Him. Because the passage says that only those who do the will of the Father will be accepted by Christ. And many people have thought that that means that you must do more, more works. It's totally the opposite of that. It's not about works. Because the works that are mentioned in the, cha in the, in the verses are big works. It's casting out demons. It's preaching, which is what prophesying is. It's doing all of these, these miracles. It's doing a lot of things. It's, it's, it's extravagant things. But it's not about that. Because what is the will of the Father? In John 6, verse 40, it tells us what the will of the Father is. And only those who do the will of the Father will truly be saved. And what is the will of the Father? It is that we acknowledge Christ, acknowledge who He is, and acknowledge His work. That we rely and trust in the work of Christ, not in our own work. So they rejected Christ's finished work on the cross. And they have not confessed their sins. And that's why Jesus will say, I never knew you. And this warning is serious for us in the church. Because many of us will say, yes, I know Jesus. Yes, I understand a few things about Jesus. I've come to church for many years. But Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5 to 6, and he says, Examine yourselves and see if you are in the faith. 
So have we truly confessed Christ, or is our Christian faith only a profession? Is it only an external thing? It's only something we do, and something we we try and, and live out? Or is the confession of our faith real, sincere, genuine, and are we willing to lay our lives down for Christ and surrender our lives to Him? Because what Jesus Christ is saying when He says, Many will say, Lord, Lord. He's not talking about doing more. He's talking about trusting in Christ. And only those who truly trusted in Christ will be the ones who will enter. Those who have surrendered their lives to Christ. And then finally, from verse 24 to 29, we have the foundation of faith and the very well-known Example of the man who's built his house on the rock and on a solid foundation, the other man who's built his house on the sand. We teach the song to children as well. They sing the song of the wise man who's built his house on the rock and the foolish man who built his house on sand. And Jesus Christ concludes with helping us to avoid what happens in verse 15 to 23. Because Jesus Christ doesn't want us to be part of those who will either be deceived by false teachers or be the ones who stand before Him and say, Lord, Lord, but we've done all of these things for you. He's drawing the crowd to the final important part of what their lives are built upon. Who do they trust? Do they trust the religious leaders? Do they trust their own works? Or do they trust the firm and solid foundation. Salvation is not found in religious teachers. It's not found in religion. It's not found in morality. And it's difficult. It's a difficult balance to find because am I saying we should not be good people? Am I saying we shouldn't be nice? Am I saying we shouldn't be courteous? Am I saying we shouldn't be concerned about our neighbor? No, of course, those things must come naturally as a result of what has happened in our lives. But we cannot trust in our own goodness. And neither can we trust in those who preach. That includes me, I'm preaching right now. We can't trust the life of a person because every single person behind the pulpit is a sinner and falls short. Now it's important for every single person in spiritual leadership to focus and maintain the, the standards that God has set for spiritual leadership, that's very, very important. And we strive to do so, and we must. But there are many throughout history, spiritual leaders and those who have preached, who have fallen. And it shakes the faith of many, and that's a reality, but it shouldn't be so. Why? Because our faith is never in our own goodness, neither in the goodness of that person that is teaching. It must always be in Christ. Now, what is the foundation? Why does Jesus Christ speak of this solid foundation, this rock that that the person built his house upon? Well, we know what that rock is. In Matthew 16, verse 16 to 18, Jesus asks his disciples, who do men say that I am? And Peter, of course, says that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says to him, Blessed are you, Simon by Jonah, because flesh and blood has not revealed this to you at my Father in heaven. And then he says, You are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Now it's important to know that Peter is not the rock, because in, in Greek, Peter is actually a small stone. And the statement, which is, you are the Christ, is the rock. So Peter's never the rock the church is built upon. But it was his statement that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Because Jesus Christ is the rock. Jesus Christ is our foundation. Those who confess Christ have security. Why? Because their lives are not built upon their own good works, their own goodness, their own righteousness, but on Christ. And that's why Jesus Christ concludes with this, because he, he asks the question, what is your life built upon? He's so asking the crowd if their life is built upon what the religious leaders are saying, or their own morality or goodness, or is their life built upon God's provision and who God is. And God's greatest provision is standing in front of them and preaching. 
But I ask you the same question today. What is your life built upon? Is it built upon Christ, the rock, the firm foundation, and in Him we then find that security? Because Jesus says, He who hears these words and does them, that person's life is built upon the rock. Or is our lives built upon sand, religion, philosophy, good works, church? Unfortunately, those things are sand. And when the difficult parts of life come, when the storms come, when the doubts come, the winds of life come, and the rain, it washes that away. Because we cannot build our, our Christian lives on religion or philosophy, good works, or church. We build our lives on the Lord Jesus Christ. So this passage is only uncomfortable for those who don't know Christ. When I read Matthew 7, it doesn't make me un uncomfortable at all. I'm not concerned about being that person that says, Lord, Lord, why? Because I don't boast of doing all of those things. And neither does anyone who truly knows Christ boast of anything that they've done. So we shouldn't be concerned. This is an encouragement. It's an encouragement because the solid foundation is the Lord Jesus Christ. And when our lives are built upon Him, we are secure. But for those who don't know Christ, for those who haven't built on, on the rock, but build their lives on other things, they are the ones who need to be concerned. And it's a question we all have to ask. We have to examine ourselves. But for us who are confident in the Lord Jesus Christ, it brings security. How can we know if we are in Christ? Because if you are listening to this and you might be concerned, there are people that will be concerned. But how can we know? How can we know that Jesus Christ will not say to us, depart from me, I never knew you? Well, have you confessed the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you confessed Jesus as Lord? Do you believe that He died and rose again for your sins? Have you repented of your sins and have you turned from your old life? If we've done that, that is what God requires, that complete Trust, acknowledgement of sin, and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. If you don't trust in your own goodness, if you don't believe that God is keeping score, if you're not concerned about the external but focused on Christ, that is how we know that we are in Christ. So let us take comfort as God's people at this time. But also, let this be a warning to us. That not just be, it's not just because someone comes to church, not because they say they're a Christian, not because they talk about Jesus, that that means they truly know Christ. It is our responsibility to live out the calling that God has given to us, that we become an example, that we bear good fruit, and that we draw men and women to the Lord Jesus Christ. This passage is a warning but a great encouragement to us and we can say with confidence that one day we'll stand before the Lord and he will receive us unto himself and we will be with him forever because he is our Lord he is our Savior and he is the one that we serve let us pray our Heavenly Father we come before you Lord today we thank you for your word we thank you for your truth and we pray, Lord, that you'll help us to, to live our lives for your honor and glory. Help us to be discerning and help us to build our lives on the rock, the firm and sure foundation. Thank you, Lord, that the Christian gospel, the message of Christ is not vested in man, not built on the works of man or the requirements that you have of man but it's built on you and your finished work. Now I pray for each and every person watching and listening that might be concerned by this passage. And, and maybe you should be concerned. And if you are concerned, we need to maybe follow through with what Paul says, examine ourselves. Maybe 
God is speaking to you right now. I pray that you will turn to Christ. Turn from the old life. Turn from the old ways. Repent of your sin. And confess Christ as your Lord and Savior. Acknowledge who he is and that he died and rose again for you and for your sin. So maybe this is that moment, but you have to be honest with yourself, examine yourself, and turn to Christ. Lord, we thank you that we know that you are with us, and thank you that we can have full assurance that our lives are built upon the rock because you are that rock. We just commit ourselves to you, Lord, today. In your wonderful name we pray, the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Thank you very much for joining us today. May you be greatly encouraged this week as we continue to spend time with the Lord. Let us pray without ceasing. Let us read the Word of God and know that in Him we are secure and we have a hope. Be encouraged this week and please join us again next week as we continue in our series on the Gospel of Matthew.